All right, so this episode, uh, we know a lot of you guys are going to love this episode because it talks about your favorite body part, biceps. In fact, when somebody tells you to flex your muscle, what muscle do you instinctively flex? Yep, it's your bicep. So this episode's all about bicep training. Now, a lot of people think the biceps are simple. It just curls the arm. Like, how complex can it get? Believe it or not, there's much more to training the biceps than just flexing the elbow. Elbow positioning and where you feel the tension of the exercise makes a big difference. So in this episode, we go through all of it. We go through the anatomy and function of the bicep. We talk about why it's important to develop and work your biceps, even if you're an athlete and you don't care about having uh, nice-looking arms. Um, it's actually quite functional to have well-developed biceps. And then at, towards the end of this episode, we give you a full bicep workout for free. So Adam, Justin, and myself put the whole workout together for you. Uh, so it's all here in this episode. So we know you're gonna it's gonna you're gonna go away with some tangible stuff you can apply to your training. Also, we have a free guide that talks about training your arms um, and gives you more uh, information. You can find that at mindpumpfree.com. So we know you're gonna love this episode. But before it starts, I want to let everybody know that Maps Starter is 50% off. Now, Maps Starter is the workout program. It's a full body workout program for beginners and people who haven't worked out in a long time. So if you want to get all the benefits of resistance training, you know, building muscle, burning body fat, sculpting your body, uh, but you've never done it before, you haven't done it for a long time, MAP Starter is the perfect program to follow. Here's the best part. You don't need a gym. All you need are dumbbells and a stability ball or a physio ball. That's it. And you can do the whole workout. So again, it's 50% off. It also makes a great gift. If you're advanced, but you have family members or friends who you'd like to encourage to lift weights, but they don't know where to get going or where to get started, get them Map Starter as a gift. It really shows that you care about them. So here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsstarter.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.com and use the code STARTER50, S-T-A-R-T-E-R-5-0 with no space for the discount. I'm excited about this episode, I but I want to do it a little bit different and- Justin, I think you should run this one. I mean, I'm actually excited about this one, you guys. This is uh, this is definitely in my wheelhouse, yeah, as yeah. you say, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah. It. It's very frequent love, in my in my activities. I love it. Yeah, no, it's something that we we do get asked this a lot, um, and it is one of our more popular guides uh, that get downloaded mm -hmm. on our in our our mindpumpfree.com is you know talking about arms yeah. and how to build. And press them arms, specifically uh, the biceps. Well, well, tr check this out. If I say to you right now, show me your muscle, what muscle do you instinctively flex? Yeah, your bicep. Well, be your careful with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you might get something else. What, do you, it's yeah, almost, <laughs> all, what, do you, what else do you get? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's almost always the bicep. <laughs> it's, mean, it's, Justin does some people are creative, but yeah, I see where you're going yeah. with this. Justin does a calf flex. <laughs> yeah, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> totally. but, but it's true. It's like the muscle of all the muscles of the body. You can ask a little kid. Why is that? Is there is it is there history behind that? Like what what came up with the, the why is the, why is the bicep flex the universal check out my muscle? I have no idea. Yeah. I I, it, it, probably because it's the most well-known flex. You know what I'm saying? Like back in the day, there were. If you go back to the strength sports, if you look at the history of spring, strength, you know sports, what? Actually, I bet you it has some. I bet you that was like the universal like first flexing pose. Like if we go all, right. go back to like original that's, bodybuilding, I would think right. that that's like the first original pose. That's right. Because if you go all the way back, strong men used to perform feats of strength, and what they would do is they do things like lift a horse or. Mm lift anvils and, and things like that and demonstrate well, you saw a lot of propaganda where they're rolling up their sleeves and they're showing their arms off too. So that's yes. probably part of it. Yes, and, and, and strong men used to be um, just strong and the way they looked didn't matter. And oftentimes they were fat. They were kind of overweight and beefy. Then you had this new class of strong men um, like Eugene Sandow being one of the more well-known uh, strong men. He's actually the, the guy that's the statue for Mr. Olympia is mm -hmm. Eugene Sandow. And here is this guy. He was 180-something pounds. He had a six-pack. And he looked like, uh, for all intents and purposes, what a bodybuilder would kind of look like. Of course, this was back in the day when they were you know, natural and whatnot. But he looked very different. Yeah. And people would show up to see his feats of strength, but people would also like to just look at him mm -hmm. because he looked – he wasn't this big, fat, strong man. Yeah, he actually bronzed his body, I believe. 
Did he? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know about yeah. that. Where did you hear that? <laughs> I've read, I saw a documentary about that. Oh, really? Yeah, like he would go on the ta- he would tan his like, body. No, like they, they they did a cast of his body and then oh, I think you might then be they right. Bronzed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You might be right. Yeah. So so that was kind of the first like glimmer into like you know that people appreciated the body just for just for its muscle the way it looked. Well, when Doug Google's him right away, the first pose that popped up was his standing double bicep pose. That's it. That's what I was just gonna say. So and then bodybuilding competitions kind of popped on you know under the scene so he was first right yeah and, and and they would the bodybuilding contest used to have a strength feat and then they would get on and then they'd stand there and flex and that's one of the first flexes was that that arms up double bicep you know flex and so that became synonymous with show me your muscle obviously we have a lot of muscles in the Dude, whole look body at that, look at that dumbbell that thing is ridiculous <laughs> yes <Yeah>, massive <laughs> now do you think it's partially too because it, it it you open up you expose yourself so you can see chest you can see abs and then you're also flexing your bicep because it's it's weird to me that we would at one point choose one of the smallest muscles on your body to show off like look at me I'm muscular. Yeah, I mean Or is that why? Cuz it's the smallest muscle and you've developed it to look decently sized. Well, it's your arm. And and, it's, and, and think and about that. Like, yeah, muscular arms demonstrate strength. And arms typically are what shows. If you're if you're a guy, for example, you know, you can wear pants all the time. Um, but you know, every once in a while you're going to wear short sleeves and people are going to see your arms. And having muscular arms demonstrates that you probably work out. Having well-developed biceps tends to show that. And so when people say, show me your muscle, you know, because of the history of it and the fact that it kind of, you know, demonstrates that maybe you work out, whatever. Um, and it's less intrusive than like, you know, show me your abs, you know, you got to pull your shirt up or whatever. It's just a very easy pose. And then you're right, Justin, there's that old poster of, um, what was her name? The, the uh, Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter. The, Who's you know, that? you don't know who Rosie the Riveter was? I don't. You'll, you'll recognize the poster. Yeah. This is when it's the we can do it, you know, kind of when all like it was World War II, I believe, right? Yeah, and it's when all when all the men were off to war. A lot of men were off to war, and women had were, were called to the workforce. Oh yes, yeah, and it's it's her rolling up her sleeve and kind of doing the bicep flex. Um, I didn't know she had a name. I thought that was just a character. Yeah, no, that was the name of it, um, and it's a very popular. Is she a real person or is that just a artificial no, character? That no, was it was made. a character. Okay, yeah, kind of like it. Uncle like Sam. Uncle Sam. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Got exactly. It. Got it. So the bicep kind of demonstrates, you know, it, 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 it exemplifies that. So it's a very popular muscle to train. Uh, let's talk about the anatomy a little bit and the function of the bicep before we get into that. I think that's important. We don't need to go too deep in the weeds, but... <laughs> There's the, not a lot going on yeah, here. Yeah, well, I mean, actually what's interesting about <laughs> the that... flexion of the flex. elbow. <laughs> exactly. Extend. Like that's the main function, right? Is to flex the arm or bend the elbow. Um, but it also rotates the hand. So if you're, if you're listening at home, you can take your hand... Flex your arm a little bit with your palm up and then turn so that your palm faces down. And watch what happens to your bicep. You'll notice that your bicep shortens and lengthens a little bit. When I was, you know, when I was a kid, my uncle used to do that. He used to say, Hey, you want to see my, my muscle uh, dance? And he'd do this thing. And then, you know, years years after I had another uncle had a tattoo on his arm. Is actually oh, yeah. he, he was in the was Navy. It, Hula girl? it was a naked girl. And, was like, oh, yeah. and he'd say, You want to see the naked girl dance? <laughs> 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 what a fantastic trick. Yeah, what a what a what a uh, cool guy. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Um, so it does flex the elbow, meaning bends the elbow. It does rotate the palm, so it supinates the hand. But it also does something else. A lot of people don't know. It actually brings it adducts or abducts the shoulder. It brings the the arm up in front of the body. This is why when you do curls, you if you're going trying real hard, you naturally want to kind of bring the elbow up. So it's got a little bit more function than just flexing the elbow, but it's a pretty basic, uh, you know, in terms of muscle function, it's a pretty basic uh, muscle. The attachments, there's two heads of the bicep, meaning there's two main parts of the bicep. That's why it's called a bicep, bi meaning two, sep meaning head. There's two of them. And the attachments are close enough to each other that you can't really work different parts of the bicep. That's important to note. Like if you listen to our past episode on the chest, we talked about how you can work upper chest and in the middle of the chest and lower chest by changing the angle of your presses, for example. With the bicep, you, you, you can't work the upper bicep. You can't work the lower bicep. And that's because the chest has different, a bunch of different attachments. That's right. It attaches up and down the sternum, whereas the bicep, it's you know pretty close. There's the two heads attached right next to each other um, on either end. And so you can't really you, you can't isolate or work the upper bicep or the lower bicep, even though some people might say you can. Uh, it's false. It, when it contracts, the whole thing contracts. And then you can't really work the outer bicep and the inner bicep. There are studies that show that there's maybe more activation on the outer head and the inner head with different exercises, but 
boy, are you splitting hairs. It doesn't, it, you, you're not going to necessarily change the shape of your bicep by changing the angle of the exercises. Uh, the shape um, is largely almost entirely determined by genetics. By genetics. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now it's involved in anytime you lift something or hold something or pull something. Your biceps are involved. Anytime you carry something in your arms, whether it's a briefcase or your, your groceries, your biceps are involved. It's yeah, I've seen different looking biceps for sure. Like you know, like ones that are like pretty long looking as far as the long muscle bellies versus like like a softballs like sort of sticking up. Dude, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, the length of the belly of the muscle makes a big difference in terms of how it looks. Right. Bodybuilders, professional bodybuilders, they have a few things working for them and why they're able to develop their incredible physiques, uh, steroids aside. Um, one of them is their ability to build muscle. They just build muscle very easily compared to the average person. The second thing is they all have very long, full muscle bellies, meaning if you look at the bicep and you, and you look at it including the tendon, it's less tendon, more muscle. Less tendon, more muscle means you have more muscle belly. And as that muscle gets bigger, you just have a greater um, potential for muscle size. A shorter muscle belly would be more tendon, less muscle. And you can't change that. No workout mm -hmm. routine, no exercise will change that. That's genetic. <clears throat> if it's a short muscle belly, you're limited in terms of you know how big that muscle will look. And one of the ways you can tell that is like the, the gap that is when someone flexes their bicep, how much of a gap that they have between the, the bicep and actually their forearm. Some people have a... A bicep that goes all the way across yes. because of, because they have a long muscle belly like that, which in which in turn can give create more of an illusion that you have a bigger looking bicep. So. That's right, and you can't change that. So if you hear somebody say this exercise gives you longer looking biceps, um, you know that they're full of crap. Um, the only way to do that would be to detach your muscle somehow and reattach it uh, somewhere else. Which I don't recommend. I don't. I yeah, highly don't uh, recommend that. Um, but yeah, it gives you this. It's a, it's a very popular muscle to train. I'll tell you what, the first exercise I ever did, I can pretty much guarantee, and I don't know exactly what it was, but I'm pretty sure it was a bicep exercise. I'm pretty sure the first resistance training exercise I did was picking up a dumbbell and doing a curl. And it's funny with kids, when they go to the gym, you bring kids to a gym, they instinctively say, hey, go lift weights. Yeah, go, that is the first move they do. Well, yeah, they do the, a curl. Of, think about it real quick, you know, row, press, um, squat. I mean, it it is for sure, uh, and even compared to tricep pushdown, which would probably be the second easiest. It's definitely the easiest movement to figure out. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the it's almost it's almost hard to fuck the mechanics up. Although you can, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think there there's a more optimal way to to do a bicep curl, which we'll get into that when we get into workouts and stuff. But uh, it's definitely one of the easiest exercises anybody could do to go in there and just pick it up mm -hmm. and and feel it in the right place and say, hey, I'm working my biceps it's out. True. Yeah, it's true. And it's it's definitely the muscle that I focused on early on. You know what I mean? Because it's the muscle. Oh, dude, as, I used to do bicep curls every every workout. Yes. Non-stop. <laughs> and curls hammer the, the girls. Shit. You know, and there, there, there's definitely some things to all that frequency and hammering that I did as a kid has as, as been somewhat uh, – you know, a blessing later on in my life. Now it's like I don't have to address them that much, and I, they actually respond really well mm -hmm. um, because of the frequency that I trained them for so long. But I, I definitely was stuck in a hard plateau for many years as a kid because I didn't really fully understand programming. I didn't understand the importance too of like what types of exercise I should be doing. Like there was a lot of things that I, I could have been doing better I'm, that didn't come till later. I'm glad you said that because just because it's <clears throat> simple and basic when compared to other larger muscle groups. And just because you can't necessarily uh, isolate you know, the long head from the short head of the bicep, the two different heads, or train the upper and lower bicep, that does not mean that you can't construct routines that are far more effective than others. And there are factors that you want to consider when it comes to biceps. It's still not so simple that you just do curls. There are ways you can train your biceps to make them respond much faster and much better. One thing I want to touch on before we get into like training the bicep, we can't forget the brachialis muscle. The brachialis muscle is a – it's actually the prime elbow flexor. A lot of people don't know this. It's a muscle that lies underneath the bicep, and the brachialis muscle is worked every time you work out your biceps, but it's especially worked – 
whenever you do a curl where your hand is in a neutral position. And to that point, mm -hmm. this is where you get these, uh, you know, this, these bro myths of I can, I can, you know, build the outside of my bicep, but where there's some value into doing things like this to create that illusion, right? If this muscle runs underneath the bicep, right, from your forearm, and if you develop that and it gets a little bit bigger, it will push out the the bicep. It'll totally. make it look like it, it you made it grow wider. Totally. And so it's not like you're targeting the width of your actual bicep belly, but it's because you're targeting another muscle that runs underneath the bicep, which then creates that illusion of having a bigger, wider bicep. Yes. To target the brachialis, the ideal exercise would be a hammer curl. Um, this is where your palm is facing in a neutral position. So supinated means palm up. So imagine if you're holding a, a bowl of soup in your hand. That's how I first learned it. Pronated is the opposite. That's where your palm is facing down. Neutral would be in between the two. So it's like instead of doing a curl with your palm up, it's like you're doing a curl, but your thumb is coming up. It's the G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip. Yeah, exactly. Or <laughs> just the reason why it's called a hammer curl, the same way you would hit a hand with a hammer. Right? Exactly. So exactly. A neutral grip. And that works the brachialis. And uh, people who neglect doing exercises with the pronate, with the, the neutral grip, um, are neglecting? Yeah, a, they're missing out. They're totally missing out. Yeah. So that's just one uh, kind of thing you want to you, you want to understand when working the bicep is also pay attention to the brachialis. Now, if you do curls with your palms facing down, you're still working the bicep. You're still working the brachialis, but you're also working another muscle called the brachioradialis, which is a the top of the forearm. It's a forearm muscle. So we don't need to get too deep into that because we're talking about the biceps today. But just so that you know, if you ever do a re what's called a reverse grip curl, you'll get really sore in the top of your forearm near the elbow. Now, before we get into the workout stuff, um, you know, I think it'd be neat to share some of the things that were like, I don't know, major pivotal moments in, in your training career that like really changed like how you trained your biceps uh, in particular. And for me, like one of the first things that... Um, I, I remember like piecing together and this is part of why we have a YouTube video that's gone viral that I think has done really well. It's also received a lot of criticism from people um, because of what you mentioned earlier, Sal, about part of the, the um, biceps function is to adduct the, the shoulder, mm -hmm. right? So because it involves the shoulder, uh, there is that that rolling position at the very end that is, if you want it full contraction of the bicep, you could actually rock at the very end. The problem with that tip or allowing people to do that is the average person that goes in the gym to do an exercise tends to excessively do that. Mm -hmm. And they use momentum, they swing from the bottom, and then they use the shoulder rock at the end to close off the movement. And what ends up happening is the bicep doesn't carry as much of the load. Shoulder is a bigger, stronger muscle. And if you're also using momentum, then the bicep is really getting a, a, a terrible workout. And it so is. And you're going to cause problems. In my experience, doing lots of that results in bicep tendon inflammation up by the shoulder. Right. This is a very common uh, problem. So if you're somebody that likes to work out and you've been working out for a while and you notice pain in the front of your shoulder – where it hurts even to push on it, and you do anytime you do a press, whether it's an overhead press or a bench press, it hurts, and you think something's wrong with your shoulder. A lot of times, it's inflammation of the bicep tendon mm -hmm. that rolls over the shoulder joint. And in fact, oftentimes I take clients, and they would tell me about their shoulder pain like this, and all I would do is stretch out their bicep, massage their bicep, and then have them do a movement where normally they would get some pain, and they'd be like, "Oh my god, the pain's gone," and it was a temporary fix. But it was a great way to highlight to them, hey, look, it's not your shoulder joint. It's actually your bicep tendon that's inflamed. And doing lots of curls like that where you're, where, you're, where you're abducting the shoulder at the same time, in my experience, causes those problems. This is why I used to train uh, – you know, I've trained a lot of doctors and physicians, and I've also trained physical therapists. Physical therapists who have lots and lots of experience in correctional exercise but very, very little experience when it comes to performance training or training for hypertrophy or muscle building. And if you ever watch a physical therapist go into a gym to work out, besides correctional exercise, like they're actually in there to build muscle, they think muscle function. And they'll actually go and do something like that. Like, okay, I know the bicep flexes the elbow, but also abducts the shoulder. And they'll do stuff like that. And it, I'll have to come and, and say something to them like, okay, look, I know that's the function, but don't work out that way. You're going to cause problems. And you're not going to get the most development. It's one and that the, comes from experience. It's one of the biggest mm -hmm. debates that's uh, that we have online with people. I mean, that if you go back and you look, and uh, Jackie can link the in the show notes the video of where I'm teaching a 
split sense bicep curl and I and I cue to retract the shoulders and keep the elbows sucked back by your side and don't allow them to rock forward. You know, a good hundred comments on there are a bunch of trolls that are coming on there mm -hmm. and trying to school me on the anatomy and the function of the bicep. And I'm fully aware of that. But what I also know is that I've trained enough people that when they first get in the gym and they learn how to bicep curl, if you let them move the shoulder back and forth, they end up taking over the movement. It's a more dominant muscle. Mm -hmm. It's a stronger muscle. So if you are given the green light to go ahead and use the shoulders for that, they end up rocking and using momentum and they don't get as much effort put from the from the bicep, which this is why we're training this, right? So mm -hmm. if that's the case, uh, I would much rather teach a client how to retract, depress the shoulders, keep the elbows in a fixed position. And I used to give the, as if you had a pin or a rod that went through your elbows, went through your rib cage and then out to the other elbow. And that, that elbow cannot leave that rod the entire time that you're doing this curl. Now that was a game changer for me. I, I remember learning that and then a, a first applying it to myself and then later on applying it to clients. And you get and, better results. Oh, mm -hmm. way better results. Yep. And what's nice is that if, if you lay that foundation right and you do a really good job of learning the, the mind-muscle connection of the bicep, taking the bi making the bicep do most of the load and work, then later as you become a more advanced lifter, you can do things like cheat curls and you can throw a little what we call like body English you know, into the movement and give that little extra effort with the shoulder, and you're going to be probably just fine. But for the most part, I would say stay away from that. Right. And have you know, really, really 99 percent of the people listening to this podcast should definitely master the, the the movement of the bicep curl within a strict position first to get it down, and then you could add things yeah. like that. Yeah, game changer for me for biceps, and this was a game changer for all muscles, but especially for the what would be considered the simple muscles like biceps and triceps and stuff like that. Game changer for me was when I understood that that the kind of strength that you get and the adaptation that you get from exercise and working out was <clears throat> relatively specific to how you train that muscle. So what I mean by that is if you get really, really good at a standing barbell curl, you're going to get some carryover onto like a concentration curl or a preacher curl or a drag curl. But it's not going to be 100% carryover. In other words, if I gain 20 pounds of strength on a barbell curl, I'm not going to necessarily gain 20 pounds of strength mm. on a concentration curl. Now, I remember thinking to myself, like, why is this? Why is this the case? I'm working the muscle. It doesn't have all these this this long attachment, like the, like you know all these attachments like the pecs. So why is that the case? And then you really started. I started to dive in and realize that. The how muscles contract, it's known as the sliding filament theory. It's where muscle fibers running across each other attach to each other and then and then and then contract. And where they where they have to attach and contract the hardest is where you're going to build the most strength. So what that means is, in layman's terms, I'll use the barbell curl as an example. When I'm doing a barbell curl with the free weight, when I'm curling the weight, let's say I'm standing there with 50 pounds. It becomes fully 50 pounds when I'm opposing gravity directly. In other words, the heaviest part of that lift is when my bicep or my arm is about halfway totally flexed. Because from the bottom, when the bar is against my legs up to there, I'm not directly opposing gravity. I'm pushing kind of out first. Then I come up. Now I'm directly opposing gravity. Now it's fully 50 pounds. But then I curl it back a little bit, right? Then the barbell kind of comes back towards my body. So it becomes a little lighter. So most of the tension... <laughs> on a bicep curl, on a barbell curl, is mid-range, about middle way between my bicep being fully extended and fully contracted. So most of the strength gains I'm going to get are going to happen about mid-range. Now let's look at a different exercise. Let's look at a preacher curl. When I'm doing a preacher curl and my elbow is out in front of me and I'm extending the weight in front of me, the barbell is heaviest when my elbow is, fully is more fully mm -hmm. extended. Yes. And it's much easier when I get up to mid-range and, of course, when I fully contract. Because now the weight is not opposing gravity. I'm just kind of moving the weight back, and I don't have that 50 pounds anymore. So most of the strength gains, most of the adaptation is going to be at that fully extended position. Now let's look at a concentration curl. Concentration curl, old school Arnold, Arnold exercise where or I'm like bending a, over. Or like a drag curl. Or like a drag, whatever. Now I'm doing the curl, a concentration curl, and I'm bringing it up. And the hardest part of that exercise is when my elbow was fully contracted, the, the squeeze. That's where I'm going to get most of the adaptation. So that was a game changer. And the second part to that was 
also elbow position. Elbow in front of my body, elbow to the side of my body, elbow behind my body. Which is basically creating that what theory, what you just said right now. So, to somewhat. Yeah, and you, it, you combine the resistance with that, and it does that as well. So now you have all these factors. Now you can construct your workout around that. Hmm. Where am I getting most tension? Where's my elbow position? And now it's not just all curls are the same. Who cares? Yeah. Do 10 sets so of curls. That was the, that's what put the most... So, so the first one was understanding the mechanics, getting the mind-muscle connection for me. The second biggest game changer is what you just said right now and is probably number one when it came to when did I really start to see size get totally. put on my bicep was every workout from that point on, whenever I did my biceps, I always made sure that I hit all three major positions with my mm -hmm. elbow. So I would do, like you said, elbow position down by my side, elbow position out in front of me, and the elbows up above my head. So, mm -hmm. And sometimes you can manipulate that by either lying down on a bench, like with a spider curl, you know, that would yeah. simulate mm -hmm. almost like if you were behind your- Incline you. curl, concentration yeah, right. curl. Right. Yeah, all that. Yeah, it was interesting too, because uh, it's kind of a joke that like I'd stick pretty much with compound lifts and, and with athletes in general, we're training the movement, but uh, definitely something I always threw in the mix and considered were, were curls and isolating the bicep to, in order to enhance the overall mechanics of the lift and, and to sort of fortify the joints and add that strength where, you know, there was a loss within, within like say a deadlift or say like I'm doing a rounded, uh, back position carry, you know, and I have to hold something really heavy and, and have an isometric strength in that movement, um, you know, doing things like that and adding curls and adding, you know, isometric poses to where I'm really just focused on the bicep and making sure that, you know, I have the strength to sustain, uh, you know, more tension there when I need it was very important for my strength athletes. Oh, totally. And if you're, if you're a, a wrestler or a grappler, biceps are very important. Anytime you're holding squeezing, choking, gripping, grabbing someone, pulling someone. You got to have strong and stable biceps. But let's say you don't do a lot of that kind of stuff. Let's say you're a football player and you're doing a lot of pushing. Very, very, right. very often it's a lot of pushing. The bicep uh, acts as a, as a counter to the pushing movements. And you need that because it slows down, it decelerates the mm -hmm. joint. Because mm -hmm. if you didn't have a bicep and I just extended my arm real quick, my arm would break Snap. in half. Yeah. You need that that muscle to stabilize. So when people say biceps are not functional, bullshit. Remove your biceps and see how functional you yeah. are. You have to have you well, have to have the biceps. You always have to consider that. To that point too, you also have to consider that what this is why injuries occur like this in sports a lot of times is because you've you've overdeveloped the the mm -hmm. antagonist muscle so much that the other one is is suffering and then it blows out. That's like a hamstring uh, pull. Hamstring is the bicep of the leg, right? Yes. So the hamstring is the bicep of the leg. We your leg, your quads are what drive and push. And in football, mm -hmm. in most sports, you build up these dominant quads because you're working. Which is very very common. That's one of the first to blow is the hamstring, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I would probably venture to say that a lot of the uh, bicep tears you see are probably people that just neglect. To train them, and they're right. doing explosive type of their triceps. Well, right. dude, you, you you know you see power lifters tearing their biceps when they deadlift yep. all the time. All the time, strong men tearing mm -hmm. their biceps when they do like Atlas stones yep. or heavy carries. Bicep tears happen rarely when people are doing curls. It's usually when they're doing something else. It's usually when they're doing something real heavy, and the bicep is acting as a supporting role. And because the bicep isn't strong enough to support the other bigger, stronger muscles. You end, up causing, to go. you end up causing problems, which brings me to another game changer for me. Um, years ago, I had a trainer that worked for me who had, uh, and he was just very, very fit uh, young man, but he had these incredible looking arms, especially his biceps. They were just so well developed. And I knew he wasn't a bodybuilder. I just brought him on staff and I asked him, I said, you know, I sat him down with him like, dude, what do you do for your biceps? Like you have the most uh, incredible looking arms and your biceps are phenomenal. And he goes, I'm going to be honest with you. He goes, I do some curls, but I don't do a lot of curls. He goes, I was a gymnast for years. Mm -hmm. I did lots and lots and lots of chin-ups. And then I thought about it. I thought to myself, like, wow, you know what? Like, the, the best exercises for the quads are not leg extensions. They're squats. They're these compound movements. So that was another game changer for me was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there are lots of bicep exercises that only flex the elbow, but let's not negate the bicep building abilities of a palms forward, you know, supinated grip, chin up. That's like a compound movement 
for your biceps. And I think it's if you have if you're struggling developing your biceps, get really good at heavy chin ups. Um, and watch what happens. It's a great way to get those biceps. It's also out. something for you to take in consideration too when you're programming. Like uh, I remember that was a mistake that I used to do a lot. Is uh, you know I was so concerned about my my biceps, I'm hitting it all the time, and then what I don't realize is how important that role is in my rowing and pulling, all, all my pulling exercises that I'm doing, and you're getting a good workout from that, so you can count that as uh, hitting the bicep too. I mean, mm. the bicep in a seated row and in a pull-up, you know, these these movements, the bicep is a lot of times the first muscle that initiates the first bit of, mm -hmm. of, of movement in the pulling. So, you know, it, you're getting some work done when you're doing that. So, you know, there's strategies to, that's one way to increase frequency on, on some of your bicep being uh, addressed without it being a quote unquote bicep day. It's like, yep. I just did back yesterday. I'm getting a lot of good back exercise, you know, so now how I program my biceps the next day, I want to be, I want to make sure that it complements that workout and I don't overwork it too. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't know if it, I've just noticed, but like bicep and curls being uh, one of the most like a lot of people will go for shorter range of motion reps mm. and that, that, te that seems to be a, you know, a more of a thought process and a trend in that direction. So, you know, something like a chin up, like to be able to take your, your arms through that full range of motion, you get the benefits yeah. of that from all points. And speaking of full range of motion, uh, full range of motion for all exercises, but with biceps, extremely important. Yeah. Full extension. Nobody does full extension with biceps. I don't know why. They all tend to stop just short of full extension. Let the arm go all the way down and then do your curl. I think Every that, little I, centimeter counts. I think that goes back to you know a lot of the fear that was put into people. And I, I think some trainers were responsible for this of the – uh, the time under tension and don't lock out your joints. Yeah. No, I'm not telling Jeez. you to relax. Maintain tension. Right. And yeah. I think, I mean, I remember being a, a, a young trainer that uh, I, I cued like that where, you know, I would keep, you know, time under tension by uh, shortening the range up just right before they lock out, you know, and the reality was I should have been teaching clients to fully extend, but then still keep tension in the muscle, which, you know, that takes a little bit of practice and understanding of what you're doing because the default uh, thing for people to do is to lock out and rest, and right? Relax. Yeah, yeah, relax and let the joint take over yeah, but the you, load. But you also can't use as much weight. I, 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 no joke, I was 17, probably 16 or 17, added a quarter inch to my biceps because I took my preacher curls right. from stopping just short of full extension to dropping the weight like 20 pounds and going all well, the way down. Well, there you go. You nailed it. I mean, it's a very much of an ego thing to begin with, right? And so now if I have to go down that full extension, you do have to drop the load. Yeah, and, and let's be honest, guys. Uh, curls are nothing to brag about. So stop, <laughs> stop worrying about the weight you're curling. It doesn't. It's not that big of a deal. Right. It, it's it's all about form and feel with biceps far more than anything else. Well, that's, a, result. that's a really good point, too, that you make on the preacher curls because that is probably an area that it's – the irony is that you see people shortening the range up on the on The, the range. part that it's Valuable. Yeah, the range that it's most valuable at, you know, mm -hmm. all just so you could say that you preach your curl the 45 pound plates Dude, or something I, ridiculous. It's like, well, why are you doing preacher curls if you're yeah. if you're taking oh, that's away an equalizer? You're taking curl. you're Oof. taking away those last three inches. That's the reason why you do that exercise. Dude, I rarely go over fifty pound barbell with a preacher curl, and I've got really strong arms. I can curl if I wanted to. I could curl quite a bit, but I'll go fifty pounds or less, and I'm going all the way down, full extension. And it makes a huge, huge difference. So, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the best rep ranges, how many sets people should do, the type of frequency, and other techniques uh, and, and factors in terms of uh, workout programming. Now, rep ranges, this is an important one with biceps because some muscle groups just don't work well with super low reps. Yeah. This is one of them. This is one. Yeah, I love low reps. Really low reps for a lot of exercises and body parts will give you more muscle, more strength, and a better look. Biceps just don't seem to work well with super low reps. Now, there, there, there is one exception to that, um, and that is when you actually do the the one compound exercise. The chin up. The chin up. Great, yeah. great point. Absolutely. Right? If yeah. there, if there was ever an exercise that I'm going to, and yeah, my three goal, reps, four yeah, reps, right, low reps, anything under six, pretty much that I would consider doing for the bicep, it would be like a chin up and, mm -hmm. and potentially weighted. Like if it, if I could do six chin ups really easy, then I could see some good value in doing weighted, you know, three to four reps of chin ups. Like you're going to get some good bang for Very your good point. Uh, other than that, uh, all other exercises, um, low reps doesn't lend itself well to biceps. It's too easy to cheat, too much momentum, 
you start using lots of other body parts, and they just don't respond uh, very well and tends to set, set you up for injury. So I'd say for the most part, six reps is probably right about, right about as low as I would go when it comes to, to bicep training. As far as sets are concerned, like any other body part, studies will show that between nine to on the high end, maybe around 18 or 20 sets per week for a muscle group. So studies will show that nine sets is right around the lower range and around 18 to 20 sets is the upper range for really advanced people in terms of total sets per week. Personally, I average about 15 to 18 sets per week and I divide that up between three workouts uh, per week. And then that brings us to frequency. Frequency, um, most people in my experience do really great with about two to three harder workouts a week. If you're going to work out with low intensity, um, then you can work out pretty damn frequently with the biceps. You can go into the gym and hit it, you know, five, six days a week. I think that's just the important thing that uh, we have to reiterate because I think that's the mistake that I made as a kid, you know, who was trying to get his biceps to grow was, uh, and I still, it doesn't matter how many clients I've had, and I've said this to, I feel like I have to repeat this all the time, which um, more does not always mean more results. Mm-hmm. Uh, just just because we say, hey, go at 918, don't go, oh, they say 918, I'm going to do 20 to 24. No, it's like, the right dose. Yeah, it is. that, And that's the, the idea. And the reason why there's a range, 9 to 18, is maybe you're on the upper range, 18. Maybe you're on the lower range. Some people respond. I mean, I was Most people are on the lower range. So I was somebody who re- ended up responding. I'll never forget when I started to cut back on days in the gym and my body started to grow and build. So it's really trying to find that sweet spot for you. And, and the people that are highly motivated, we have like to, we have this spectrum, right? The, the ones that are really motivated to work out and they really have these goals, they want to build my, my bicep, they tend to overdo it. Mm-hmm. They tend to be the ones that, oh, I could still do another set. I feel okay. You know, let mm-hmm. me just do another exercise, you know? And before you know it, they've done 12, 15 sets in one extra or one workout just for their biceps. That's crazy amount, especially if you plan to take advantage of the benefits of frequency and coming in another day or a third day potentially in that week to hit those biceps again. By that time, you've fried the things. You've overreached. And what ends up happening is the body spends all this time and effort trying to recover, and it's not adapting and building and growing. Think of it this way. Think of your body's ability to build muscle or adapt or burn body fat as a lock. Only the right key will open that lock. And that key is quite different from person to person. There are general truths. That's why I gave that general answer of nine to maybe 18 sets per week. But the key that's going to open your lock is unique to you. Use the wrong key, you know, i.e. go too many sets or train too hard or do too little sets or train too easy. You're not going to unlock your body's ability to build muscle. So it's I'm, I'm very glad you brought that up. More is not better. The right dose is what's best. The right dose, and don't judge what the right dose is because your friend may get better results from doing more yeah. than you. Okay. And the right do- uh, the right dose is not the feeling you get in the workout. That's the where I think people like to hear they're like, oh right, I'm fine. I can do more. Yeah, I can like, yeah, that's it. I can do more. Right. I can mm-hmm. do more. So should I do more? I, and I get DMs like this all the time about our programs. Hey Adam, you know, I'm following Maps Anabolic right now. Um, but I feel like I can do more. So is it okay if I do that? I'm like, no. Yeah. yeah. Are you no. getting stronger? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you building muscle? Yes. Okay. So keep keep yeah. keep doing what you're, you're doing. Doing the right thing. Right. Yeah. Just because you can do more doesn't mean you should do more. Right. So you know, understand that if if all the studies are showing that the maximum benefits for muscle gain are falling somewhere between nine to eighteen. These are also natural athletes. So if you're somebody who's anabolically enhanced right now, you obviously can probably extend that another tw- probably to more like twenty four sets. But it, it's going to be in that. That range and you I hear people doing 30 to 40 to 50 you know sets of of bicep exercises in a week and it's just you're 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 getting really good at curling that's all you're doing you're not building a lot of you're muscle you're actually building a lot of endurance right. uh, if if you're lucky if your body can adapt you're building a lot of endurance and that's not going to build the, the kind of muscle or the visible changes in your biceps um, that most people are after when they're training biceps or any other body part with weights uh, in the gym one last thing I want to touch on Um, This is an advanced training technique, but I want to cover this because it works best for the muscles of the upper arm, and it does work. It legit does work. It sounds crazy, but it for sure works. Studies prove it, and that's blood flow restricted training. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't need to go too deep into this, but blood flow restricted training 
is the process of using like a knee wrap to to tie off the upper arm. And I don't mean completely. You're not cutting off no, all circulation. Restricted. But you're doing it enough to restrict blood flow and you'll feel it. You'll feel the veins kind of pop out, you know, pop out a little bit and you'll feel a little bit more of a pump. And then you do some bicep exercises and it burns like crazy and you get an insane, insane pump. But it does indeed work. Uh, the first time I implemented blood flow restriction training was actually when we started Mind Pump. This was a we brought this up. We brought this topic yeah, it was up. A grand experiment. And um, I did. I gained size on my arms. It works good on calves too. It tends to work good on the extremities. So that's just something little little side note. Um, if you're really really advanced, look into blood flow restricted training. It does work. Definitely lower the load. Well, yeah. I I saw the most value in the two areas you just said, calves and arms. And where I saw the most value was. When I tended to overreach in a bicep exercise, a routine, right, or any sort of arm routine, uh, I did too many sets. I, I fell right into the trap that I'm talking to you guys about just five minutes ago. I fell into that. I overreached, and I kind of fried my biceps, and it's, you know, two days have gone by. I'm still feeling it. It's the third day, still kind of feeling it, but I want to keep my frequency up at training, but I don't want to do as much damage, it's a great way to supplement frequency without putting a lot of damage on the muscle. Because, it won't replace a workout. Right. Yeah, you're right, 100%. Right, yep, and yep. that and that to me is what I – and I, I experimented enough with it to realize too that – because I loved it just like you you did when you – oh, wow, I've seen results change from it. Then what ended up happening was I was like, oh, you know, today I'll just do BFR. I'm not in the mood to do – you know, full, a full five sets of, you know, barbell curls or something. I'll just do some quick, I'll get a pump and from the BFR and then I'll move along. What I did notice was if I, if I allowed it to replace my, my regular training for my arms, it did not help me grow. And in fact, I would start to see a little slide back, but if I used it to intermittently supplement more frequency into my training, it was a game changer. Totally. So, incredible, totally. incredible tool. Totally. But it's advanced. If you're not super advanced and you haven't been training for a long time, it's also got, don't waste your time. It's also got value here. So if you have, uh, you brought up about like people that have issues with their, their shoulder, they feel pain in their shoulder, oh, or maybe rehab. you have like elbow stuff. So if you uh, are very sensitive, um, you know, to a joint, related somewhere to the bicep or near the bicep. So anytime you do any bicep exercises, especially if you go heavy, it really irritates or bothers that area. This is a great tool to use for rehab. So for clients that uh, that have issues in there, like that maybe they have a very compromised shoulder, maybe they're just re, they're, they've been coming back from a shoulder surgery. I don't want to do something dangerous like a heavy bi barbell curl. I'm not going to do a chin up with that person because I'm going to put the shoulder in a compromised position. But I definitely can do a strict, you know, cable curl, bicep curl things with really light weight and do BFR to where it's not putting a lot of stress or load on the shoulders, but then I can get this massive pump from BFR. Perfect. Ton of value for it uh, with things like that. Perfect. Now we want to leave you with uh, like tangibles. We want to leave you with an actual workout because um, you're probably listening to this episode because, you know, you want to build bigger biceps. So you're writing down, you know, notes or taking some uh, mental notes and we want to leave you with a workout. So what we did is we actually came up with a workout ourselves, um, one that you could take for free from this episode. So I came up with a workout. Adam came up with a workout. So did Justin. Um, and we made sure that they all work together. And this is going to be a three days a week kind of bicep workout. Now, in my workout, I wanted to make sure that I hit the three – elbow positions and the different tension points of the bicep. I wanted to make sure that we were able to do an exercise where there was maximum tension in the mid range of the elbow flex flexion. Um, one where most of the tension was at the full extension where the arm is almost uh, all the way open and one where the, uh, most of the tension was where the bicep was fully squeezed. Um, so here's the three exercises that I recommend in each one of these exercises in this workout, you're going to do three sets and the goal is go it's to do 10 to 12 reps. By the way, 10 to 12 reps means intense, but it does does not mean going to failure. So if, if I tell you to do 10 reps, pick a weight you know you could max out and do 12 reps with, but you're only going to do 10 reps. That goes for all of our all recommendations. Of mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. we always will, would, would advocate for you know one to two reps short of failure. That's right. Right. So so pick a weight, stop about one rep or two reps before you're you're not able to curl anymore. So that's that's how you know how intense you want to go. So the first exercise, barbell curls. This, they call this the, the king of bicep exercises. It's the most basic. It's one of the first exercises you learn 
when you first do uh, resistance training. And it is one of the best bicep building, just general overall bicep building exercises. Very easy, very basic. Do three sets of this for 10 to 12 reps. So start, try and stay within that, that rep range. The next exercise, barbell preacher curls. Same thing, three sets, 10 to 12 reps. Now with this exercise, again, really focus on full extension. Let the arm open all the way. Keep your body locked in position. You're going to find that you're not going to be able to use nearly as much weight as you do with the barbell curl if you do these properly. Um, and then the third exercise is a little bit less popular. It's called an incline curl. Some people call them drag curls. This is where you're laying back on an incline. Your elbows are, are, are hanging down, so your elbows are kind of behind your body hanging down. Let the Keep them in that position. Do not rock the elbows. It's very, very common that people want to swing the arms up when they do this. It's a great way to hurt that bicep tendon by the shoulder. So don't do that. Let the elbows fall. Full extension. And then when you come up, really focus on that squeeze at the top without bringing your elbows forward. This exercise will stretch the biceps, but it'll also work on the squeeze at the very, very top. This one burns like crazy. Also, you're going to find you're not going to be able to use much weight on this exercise right here. Make sure you rest in between each of these sets about 30 to 60 seconds, uh, maybe 90 seconds if you if you need a little bit more rest. You, want, you don't want to be out of breath uh, when you're doing your next set. That's pretty much it. So since Sal went that direction, uh, I wanted to pick some exercises that I thought lended themselves well with the lower rep range. Right? So we talked about uh, we wouldn't do anything less than about six reps, except for the one exception to the first exercise that I chose in, in my workout, which is a supinated pull-up or a chin-up, right? Now, when you do this, and our intention is to work the biceps, uh, normally when you go to do a pull-up, there's this you know pull-up where you retract the shoulders and you, and you kind of puff or lead with the chest and pull the chin or the chest up to the bar. In this case, I'm not really concerned about pulling my chest up to the bar, I'm more concerned about curling my body up to the bar. So yeah, I like to tell people to try and get your hand as close to your shoulder as possible right. at the top. So yes. like you're curling and just try and get your hand close to your shoulder. Exactly. You're not worried about retracting the scapula and getting the back involved. You're more concerned about pulling the body weight or pulling, like Sal said, the hands to the shoulders and getting a good squeeze. Now, because that's a big compound movement and you're pulling your entire body weight up, this is something that uh, I would recommend the lower rep somewhere between that three to five repetitions. And if you can do five reps really easy, then load it, you know, put a, put a plate underneath you or 10 pounds underneath you and, and do it. Find a place where it's challenging for you to get about four reps. That's a really cool exercise to start the bicep workout. And again, we're going to do three sets of everything, just like Sal's. One of the things that, you know, we, we mentioned nine to 18 for the entire week is kind of the sweet spot. So even though we're giving recommendations on all of our exercises to be three sets, you may be someone who does two sets of all these exercises that we're recommending for the week. You may be someone that could actually push potentially to four, even though I think that's a lot, because I think three is a lot for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Just mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Each person can be, can modify individually for themselves. So the second exercise uh, I'd love to do after a supinated pull-up would be go to an alternating dumbbell curl. And you could do these seated or standing. I like seated because it just puts you more in a strict position where sometimes people tend to bounce and rock um, from side to side when they're standing up. So I know it's more functional to be standing. I know you're going to burn a little bit more calories because you're standing and you're having to stabilize. But I prefer to do these seated just so you're not cheating uh, the exercise. And that's just alternating back and forth for a total of 10 to 12 reps, which means that's only five to six reps per arm, right? So five to six reps per arm, a total of 10 to 12 reps for alternating bicep curls. And then the last one, I wanted to do something different. And this is like a, a, a more recent find for me. Uh, all the years that I trained, I actually really never played with cluster sets that much. And I really, really like them, especially for bicep curls. I've messed with it, uh, cluster sets um, with all other muscle groups. Uh, biceps tend to be one of my favorites. Biceps and triceps, actually, arms are my favorite to do cluster sets with. And there's a lot of different uh, formats for a cluster set. There are a lot of different uh, parameters that you can run by. So this isn't like a you have to follow my exact rep range and sets. This is I'm just going to give you what I like. Uh, you could probably Google and see. 20 different uh, other ways to do it as far as the time and the rep range. But I like to do the, the cluster sets in four, using four reps. 
uh, and I like to give a solid 10 to 15 second rest between each set. And the idea, this is an exercise, and this will be the only exercise of all the exercises we teach that I like to take to failure. And this is, and that's how you know when you're done with the, the, the cluster set. So it's one long set, you do four reps. Now, the weight you choose for four reps is a weight that you should be able to do for eight to 10 reps fairly easy. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to do that weight for a solid eight to 10 reps. You choose that weight, but you're only going to do four reps. And then you're going to give yourself a solid 10 to 15 seconds rest before you do the next four reps. And you just keep doing that. What's neat about that is you'll see that weight. You're going to end up being able to do quite a few sets before the, the bicep completely fails. And when you figure out the total volume you did in that one long set, it's normally a lot more than what you would have done in just a basic three set. So you do four reps, rest 10, 15 seconds, four reps, rest 10, and you just keep doing that until what? Until you can't do four reps? Until failure. Until, until forms and failure is, for me, form breaking down. Mm. So strict form. Just because you can get it up by rocking your shoulder or getting a little momentum, you're done. Once strict form is broken, then you're that's where you're completed. It's not where complete exhaustion or muscle failure is. It's where form starts to at all break down awesome. where you have to use any sort of momentum to finish the rep. Awesome. I like those, but first what we're going to do is we're going to get a stringer. We're going to go into the gym. <laughs> we're going to oil up our arms. We're going to wear some sunglasses. And we're gonna curl, and we're gonna kiss our bicep. Do you even do you even know any bicep curl exercises? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like trying to think of it in my head, like right is on the fly here. This is really tough. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm gonna make a, a little more functional approach here. Uh, just it, it, actually, like the first one specifically, like I mentioned earlier, is um, we're gonna take. Um, if you have access to a sandbag, this would be amazing. Um, doing a uh, basically a farmer carry, but front loaded. So if you so get, like you're hugging the sandbag. So if you, if you could hug the sandbag and you're front loaded and you're going to walk down about forty yards and back. Now, if you don't have access to that, you can always uh, grab some dumbbells and and do like a rack position front loaded carry down and back. And you're going to want to go pretty heavy with this. So um, that's something that uh, I've done with my athletes, and uh, I love it. It's it's definitely challenging isometric exercise to. Uh, you know, to be able to sustain that. What um, about kettlebells in that position? It, kettlebells even better, right? Because the kettlebells with the weight would be rocking in front of, you, it's in in the front of, of the arm. Yeah, exactly. It's, so it's kind of pulling you out, and you're resisting that uh, tendency to want to pull your arms out. I love that. Um, so yeah, I would, I would, you know, prefer that. But I'm trying to be reasonable. Like, so if you have dumbbells, you know, go for it. Uh, we go right in from there. We're going to go into hammer curls. I'm going to address the bicep brachialis. So this is, you know, we're we're, we're going to take those. Probably a lighter weight, so definitely a lighter weight with this because we're going to go about 15 reps, um, and I, I I will take those same dumbbells for the last exercise too, so I'm going to make this real easy for you, but we'll go ahead and do 15 reps. You're going to want to keep those elbows in nice and tight and then uh, get those, you know, that neutral grip, so that, that kung fu grip. Uh, you're going to do those curls, and we'll go right in for the last exercise I'll throw at you. It's going to be our spider curl, so you're going to lean over like an incline bench and then you're going to have those arms hanging and then supinated here. So now I get that other angle, uh, you know, for the biceps. So well. let me get this straight. Are you, you're, you're doing the isometric hold. You walk with it. Let's just say we have kettlebells or dumbbells. doesn't matter. We're holding, we're in loaded position. We walk 40 yards. We walk back 40 yards. I set those down. I grab a lighter pair of dumbbells, go right into no rest, right into it, right into hammer. It's curl. Like super set. This is a giant set. So you're doing three exercises. Oh, so oh. The, and then yeah, goes yeah. So I'm going to do 15, you know, hammer curls, I'll do 15 spider curls. So oh, you, shit. You'll so probably you're gonna be able to take light. that same weight. Yeah, light. Yeah. So that that's all in, in you know, you choosing the, right, and the how, appropriate weight. And, how, and, what, two, and we'll three, do three sets. Three rounds. Three sets just, you know, because there you go. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> no, I like that. Actually, to be honest with you, doing heavy tension carries – Added size to my biceps, farmer uh, heavy farmer walk. I love the combination of the heavy tension to light high rep curls oh, too. Yeah, that yeah. would be an insane pump. Right, I'm yeah. actually going to try this workout uh, tomorrow when I'm working there out my go. arms. So there's three workouts right there. You know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday would probably be good. And then we should also talk about trigger sessions. Trigger sessions are great ways to add frequency and volume to your body without causing or creating a lot of damage. Now, in the case of biceps, this is how easy it is. On the days off in between, so you've, you've done your hard workout. You did my workout Monday, uh, Tuesday's off, Wednesday's Adam's workout, Thursday's off, Friday is Justin's workout. Well, on Tuesday and Thursday on the days off, here's what you do. 
get yourself a pair of bands, resistance bands, and do some resistance band curls. And just do enough to feel the bicep burn. Just do enough to get a pump. That's it. No harder than that. You're just trying to feel it a little bit. You're not trying to go hard or, or get a crazy workout. Do that for a few sets two or three times during the day. So in other words, all you're doing is getting a little bit of a pump in the biceps two or three times a day on the off days. Those trigger sessions, actually, they're like turbo. They really are. Like, you know, we're building the engine. We've got the car with the found these, these heavy workouts. Now you're just adding a turbo, which is going to take it to the next level. That's what trigger sessions do. And it works great for any body part. But in this case, we're talking about biceps. So apply it to the biceps. Now we do have a guide called How to Get Big Arms. And the guy talks all about arm training, bicep and tricep training. He talks about sets and reps and things on how to, you know, how to phase your workouts and all that stuff. It's a free guide. There's more information in there if you want to read more stuff. It's available at mindpumpfree.com, so you can download that. And then all the exercises and stuff we talked about, we'll make sure it's in the show notes. So if you want this all listed out for you and you want to write it all down, it's going to be all there. Um, you can also find the three of us on Instagram if you want to ask us any questions or check out and see what we're doing. Uh, in our lives. Um, Justin's Instagram page is Mind Pump Justin. Mine is Mind Pump Sal and Adam is Mind Pump Adam.